Our next speaker is Maxime is speaking on how to tackle the reusability um, problem, specifically looking at GraphQL and microservices. Maxime? Hello. Hey there. Wonderful to have you here. Thank you, Mark. Um, Wonderful. Could, have you got a slide deck for us? Absolutely. Trying to show you now. So within a couple of seconds, you should be able to see my screen. Wow, it's a beautiful, infinite it's scroll. It's the inception view. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it, okay, wonderful. It, it, okay. Okay, this is looking great. I'm going to jump off and let you do the... Um, uh, in, do your introduction and talk through reusability. Sure. So, guys, thank you for joining API Days. It's my second time. So, the first time I just came in Paris, it was a wonderful time without COVID. And now we have to deal with it. But it's very funny for me. Thank you for inviting me as a speaker. So, yes, we were going to talk about software reusability and how GraphQL and APIs could enable that in your organizations. So just a couple of words I was uh, about me. I was running in a, in a very specific IT services company specialized in complex IT software projects for big companies. I sold it two years ago and started a new company called Store, which is specializing in providing GraphQL as a service and API gateways, anything you can check it out. So the reusable software. Well, let's start. What is it? It's, it's, it's an old myth. Like like 60 years old problem. It's all started in, in 1960 with like, like how could we reuse this mass produced software components. There was a lot of research going through that. It's a real problem because, well, we, we have a lot of waste in man, man days and it's billion waste in our industry, uh, in software editors and digital project management software providers and IT service company. The, the, the reusability, if we can reuse software, we, we, we end up with a better software with a more quality and, and high reliability as just the previous speakers spoke about. But it's not that easy to enable. Um, and you don't have to think about software reusability as like kind of modules or open source or frameworks or libraries. It's a, it's a big, big, big area of different um, ways to, to perform that. Um, ERP systems in a kind of, in a way are, are providing, uh, for example, um, reusability, legacy system wrapping is itself uh, is an example of, of reusability. Um, application frameworks, obviously, design patterns, and many, many other ways to achieve um, uh, software reusability in, 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 in software industry. But let's focus on some of the, um, some basic rules. How could you enable reusability inside your organization, inside your teams? Well, we came up with many four rules, right? The first one, the most important one, the, all the research got around the reusability shows us that the only way to make it work is to make it to create inside domains. The software components reusability works inside domains and ve works very badly in generic components. So if you work in banking, insurance, transportation, or for instance, e-commerce, you will see a lot of potential reusability there. It's easier. The second one is the right size. For instance, in, in many, many years ago, ADA created a catalog of 4,000 small components, and it was a big failure. While in the same time, HP uh, in the telecommunication created just a 100 components catalog. It was a big win in the industry um, uh, for, for in the telecommunications. So the right size, if it's too big, you will, uh, if your components or your, your, your software company is too big, there will be a lot of customization and forking each time you implement it. If it's too small, you end up with uh, too many over communication here and too many uh, compli uh, complicated uh, systems. So the right size is really important. Interoperability is really, really important that the components will be really plug and play because otherwise developers will be always eager to kind of, okay, I will redo it myself if it's too complicated to plug your component to your library or your model. And discoverability is extremely important too because there is this natural resistance and inertia, inertia inside your companies. So it, Company, projects are done in silos and, and, and the teams communicate 
very badly uh, in terms of what they did, how it works. So it should be very easy to discover and play with components before using them. So why it should, why you should care now? Because as I said, it is a 60 years old problem. Why now and not yesterday and tomorrow? I think there is some very important revolutions occurred um, in the last years in our industry so that it's now possible. The first one is the serverless. It's, it's why? Because it's, it's, you, you may say like you have GitHub, you have Git repository, you have all your code in the central repository. Everybody can just look and see and developers can reuse. But the developers who inside your organization would like to reuse this code still needs to understand, integrate, debug, deploy, and run the code. And often they just abandon the whole idea and, and, and they redo the feature again. And moreover, you kind of have this problem of, um, of different technology. You may have project in Java, in PHP, in Node, in Golang. And that's why serverless is so important, because serverless offers you a way to run small pieces of code very easily. You have this AWS Lambda, Azure functions, uh, GCP functions, making this very easy to have live, small running components. And because live components can be accessed through APIs, it's very easy to reuse them. The developer doesn't have any more to understand, to read the documentation, to, to read how the database works, how he should implement classes and, and stuff. No, he just access a small live auto-scaled API. The second revolution, really important in the last years, is the explosion. Almost any project I see now are either headless or decoupled projects. And this because of uh, Angular and React.js are so popular now. So what you see is that we split between the user interface, which is obviously almost every time unique to each product, from the backend part, the, 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 what you have in the backend. So it's very complicated to force a brand to say, look, Guerlain, uh, you will use the same uh, component that Dior it will be unacceptable, and the UX is almost always different. But when you go to the backend stuff, there is a lot of um, features that could be reused easily. And because of this separation, because it's now so popular to doing PWA, headless, decoupled, call it whatever you wish in the front end, then in the backend you can reuse. And finally, there is uh, a much less known um, revolution for me, which is GraphQL. Why it's so important? GraphQL is um, um, it's a standard protocol uh, to accessing uh, your API, but it's a little bit more. It's a real query language for APIs. See it like SQL for APIs. And why it's so different? Because it's the first time, let's say, let's take REST. REST APIs, um, you design your REST API, you can provide a swagger, for your, but still the way you describe the data, the data structure, data you exchange is up in, is up to the developer who created the API. So when you are dealing with a big organization with hundreds of different REST APIs, it's very, it's, 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 you can have API management portals, developer portal, you can have X-Way, APG, whatever you have, but yet the way you exchange object, data objects is, is up to the designer of the REST API. And this is the main problem of interoperability and the uh, API adoption uh, within the company. So GraphQL kind of solved that by providing this type system. So you can describe not only the way you query with resolvers or you create content with uh, mutation, but also a very strict way to describe the data structures you exchange. So you can create a complete data graph of all of your uh, APIs and backends and, and, and stick services together so you can actually work with microservices way easier with GraphQL. Why that? So the, 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 the last revolution is actually the microservices one. You have now more in the, with the domains we said previously and the easiness of uh, creating um, APIs and the serverless. Microservices I kind of well, let's not call them microservices, let's call just, just services, domain um, bounded services, whatever you call it. But this is very important because you can split your monolith 
um, inside small reusable autonomous isolated components which are automatically scaled with the serverless and run and very easily accessible because you don't have this mess with GraphQL. You have a single graph, so all your application, front-end application consuming your mark microservices with GraphQL can access on a single graph and don't bother with, uh, with, uh, with the hundreds of small pieces of APIs um, on, on, on any sites. So, so one way to see this, this um, revolution I see really is GraphQL and domain design. This is how you could achieve real reusability and, and, um, and in an easy way, in a modern way. So the first, why GraphQL is, is, is so interesting for the domain design, which we saw that is so important for building, uh, enabling reusability and building a microser reusable microservices. Well, the first thing is the schema design is way less technical than any database design. So when you design inside a domain, uh, one of the very complicated parts is how, how to structure your, your, your objects and, and how, how you describe what are your, your business objects. And, and, and what we had previously is to say, well, we have our database. It's our modeling of our database, which kind of um, represents our business. And and this was the case for the last, I don't know, 50, 50 years. Um, the problem with that is, is that the, the, there is a lot of technical details that are um, injected with the database design. There is a lot of um, stuff that are not related to the business that are in, present in the database design. And that makes um, APIs and, and the schemas out of database extremely complicated and, and you, you, we see in the many organization problems like we have APIs which are connected to our database but to integrate those APIs it requires uh, hundreds of hours to understand just how it works because of the complexity of our backend and our databases. So how could we, so we end up to add more and more layers on top of our database to, to make it more understandable uh, easier and we end up by uh, duplicating code, duplicating APIs because of uh, um, the complexity on the backend. The schema design of the GraphQL is way less technical. It's really about the product you define, how you access, it's led by the front end, the consumption of the API, so it's really easier to do it with GraphQL. The second thing is that you are not only dealing in an ideal world or where you have only the, the databases you design and then you have your domains, but you're also exposing numerous data sources. It might be Salesforce CRM, it might be Magento e-commerce, it might be your SAP, it might be many, many other external or legacy data sources. So you actually can think of it as exposing those data sources is, is building your domain model. So imagine you had an API gateway, like kind of able to federate, stitch together many, many data sources and present them on a single graph or, or one graph per domain. This is something very cool. You can create one graph for each domain. You have client's domain, product domain, let's say uh, stocks and orders management domain, pricing model, whatever you have. And then each of these domain is covered by a single GraphQL graph, which can be then um, integrated with your different data sources, internal apps or, or editor apps, whatever. And finally, um, you can also, with the power of GraphQL and schemas teaching or federation, whatever you want, you can bring together all these uh, graphs in a single graph. So you can combine uh, domains models in a, in, a, in, a, in a global domain um, so you can combine the stuff together. Um, there are, when you combine this, you, know, you take GraphQL, you take different schemas and you combine them together, that's really wonderful. It, 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 it's really beautiful approach, but there, it comes with uh, some kind of uh, problems you have to be careful with. Well, there are many of them, but there are some of them are, that are really um, um, blatant. It's like the first one is the resolver's performance. Um, because of this, um, this GraphQL way of, of, of splitting your queries into small parts and calling your backend, there, you can 
you can experience really painful resolvers performance issue if you are generating too complex queries. So you have to be very careful uh, to in analyzing how actually your queries are being resolved to see where the performance bottleneck may occur with, when you're joining big tables or making requests on very long um, poll in backend APIs. The second thing is mutation federation are complicated. It's way easier to say, I take clients from Salesforce, I take orders from SAP, and I, 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 I join them, stitch them together in a single query, and I get results like all the queries from all the orders from this client. When you want to create an order and the client, for example, at the same time, so this is a mutation, it's way more complicated because you are dealing in transactional world. So you have to create transactions that span against several uh, data sources and several applications in the backend. So you can work on it, but it's way, way more complicated to create um, federated mutations. And finally, team dependencies, because you split up your monoliths in a small um, teams and small pieces that each of them are responsible of uh, of a schema, it might be complicated to roll out application and new releases because of these dependencies. I cannot release my new schema because the schema of uh, order management is not ready. So next step, what would be the future from my point perspective of, of this world full of small APIs and reusable uh, um, small pieces of components. It, for me, we need an AP, NPM for APIs. I call it like this. Um, so imagine you have a platform, a marketplace of small reusable consumable APIs, which are created by, by API startups, legacy software editors, some corporate IT departments. So we could, we could see an ecosystem like this, where we have this central repository marketplace of consumable serverless, uh, API resolving one small um, domain problems, and then they could be consumed by corporate IT departments, working with agencies and IT services companies who could build some of them or recommend components to the company. So this can, we could create kind of like a big framework and NPM for APIs. This is exactly what we're trying to do at Code.Store. Um, so if you want five, five seconds of self promotion, but if you have, if you want to build something like that, you can try Code.Store and teasing, teasing, teasing coming soon within a few weeks, we will be releasing the first fully open source GraphQL native API gateway. So stay tuned, follow us on Twitter and you will see GraphQL portal soon. Thank you very much. And I think I'm done now. So I stopped presenting and so we have time for questions. Um, that was fantastic. A real, um, uh, <clears throat> a real quick um, uh, overview of like you went deep and you went uh, wide. So that was fantastic. So, yes. the, so we've got one question. Uh, is it possible to combine 10 to 20 API endpoints into a single domain graph, even when these APIs are designed by multiple teams or multiple yeah. companies? Specifically, this is the point of GraphQL, and this is why we are releasing this uh, this GraphQL API gateway. This is exactly to solve that problem. You have multiple teams, and often not even teams, but you have also software editor like Salesforce and some teams. And yes, you can combine many, many of them as much as you want in a single graph. And you have some issues like how to deal with this naming of same types. I have a customer on my one team and another team. I also define some custom how to, how we can stick these types together. But yes, absolutely, it's possible. We are we are seeing it on many, many projects. Um, there's another question. There is. So enabling code reuse at large scale, will that avoid companies having to do their own IT refactoring? Well, n no, because the refactoring is, is a healthy, healthy way to do things. But indeed, it, what we see is what you, what you see with a big monolith is that you build up your monolith, and over the course of few years, you have teams are changing, and the newcomers like I won't touch anything that already working, so I don't touch. I build other feature outside, and after a few years, you get your Frankenstein monolith that nobody understands how it works. So splitting up uh, it in a small microservices or small components will actually provide you, well, um, 
avoid refactoring on the whole system, replatforming at least, but you will still have to refactor small components. But it's a very easy task compared to refactoring an entire monolith to say like, I, ref I, 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 ref I refactor only the, 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 the stock management or order management, for example. Okay, great. How do you avoid coupling software elements at large scale? Uh, all the industry is trying to decouple elements. Is this yeah, the new well, speed? No magic, no magic here. Yes, the, the biggest uh, danger of microservices architecture is like uh, building an interdependent, a distributed monolith. Uh, so the way to avoid that is it's d uh, domain design. This is kind of, the, the, there is no golden rule like saying, okay, the, yeah. you that you have to do domain design. So you I can- I mean, I think, yeah. yeah sorry, sorry, you go. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So yeah, the, it's like stick together microservices that communicate a lot. You, you, a lot. You can see if you see a lot of intercommunication between services. You maybe say, "I need a, a single service," and and putting all the services responsible for the same domain orders, for example, in the same um, space could you could help you to avoid that? But you cannot this, entirely avoid it. Yeah, there's been some discussion over the last two days around um, things like services meshes and those sorts of things, and it's. I mean, to me, the discussion that seems to have been coming up is it's not now about reducing complexity by going with one platform and one vendor, but it's more accepting that actually there's, we're going to be using a whole ton of components and now you've just got to have an orchestration capa yeah. capabilities better. It's already happening. Have it's already happening. Yeah, yeah, it's already happening. We have but many, many vendors. So then one of the, uh, the other thing you talked about, and this relates to what you were just sharing there as well, is, is that like, so you're saying GraphQL, it's easier to do the domain modeling and, you know, um, your data systems design. When you look at the tools for doing data modeling or even in GraphQL using the schema, they're designed for tech people, but we're wanting the business side to be able to be um using data to drive insights and design new products and all of that sort of it's there seems to be like a disconnect in um how business side of things can contribute to designing the data models that's going to create the new products and the new insights how yeah. how do we bridge that i i think first of all graphql is way simpler than uml or or database right. modeling so this is a first step they when we have this initiative like Cucumber or or specification by example, so kind of trying to 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 fill that gap. I think that what we see is GraphQL is easier enough to understand, or at least the schema is readable enough to say, okay, I can see like I, we we, are, we see some initiative like for example some some plugins in Figma to create GraphQL. Because GraphQL is so well understood by front-end guys, so we could go in a way like we design an app in the UX, and then this is a product owner who designed that with the UX, and then we could one step more to generate the schema because we know the queries we need, we know the data types we need, and the types in, in GraphQL is so more easier to understand than uh, for uh, uh, for databases. So I think this is this is one way to do it. At least we, I, I think the graph. I really love, I really love GraphQL. Yep. Yeah. Really? You can't tell at all. Okay. There is one last question, but I'm going to ask if you can answer that in the stage no, chat no when you get yeah. off, because yep. we do need to move on. But really fantastic. And you've really inspired everyone to jump bye bye. in and keep the conversation.